Before there were self-help books, there were animals. We'll explain next on In Life. This program is brought to you in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and through the financial support of viewers like you. Thank you. Funding for art segments on In Life is provided by the Illinois Arts Council, a state agency. Hi, I'm Becky Cramblett. Welcome to this edition of In Life. Since the beginning of time, animals have been serving humans. Horses have been used in hunting and transportation. Dogs have been used in times of war and as eyes for the blind. Well, on today's program, we'll take a look at how animals continue to serve humans on an emotional level. In a minute, we'll go to Refuge Ranch and take a look at how they use horses to offer emotional support to kids. But first, we look at Quincy Humane Society and their program where they use dogs to make a difference. On a sunny morning in Quincy, a happy little Shih Tzu escorts the Humane Society's Sally Westerhoff into Bickford Cottage for a visit. This nine-month-old Shih Tzu appears to enjoy working a room, and for the residents, most of whom have Alzheimer's, it's a chance to provide animal-assisted therapy, which in turn is how the dog came to work for the society. Sally explains the program and how she came to be a part of it. In the early 1980s, they were looking for someone to do uh, animal assisted therapy at the local nursing homes and I'm a nurse and I was only working part time and had loved pets and mm -hmm. felt like it was a good fit for me so I would pick up um, dogs at the animal shelter and then take them around to the nursing homes and visit with people and um, got me interested in the topic and um, I just did a lot of research and found that there is a lot of research into the benefits of pet pets for people. Um, a lot of not only physical but emotional and psychological mm -hmm. benefits as well. Um, and it just makes perfect sense that uh, if people have pets, they have something to think about other than themselves and um, it keeps them in a routine where they have to get up, they have to feed the pet. If they have a dog, they have to take it for a walk. Um, but it isn't just cats and dogs that are beneficial. It can be an aquarium of fish, mm -hmm. it can be a bird in a cage. Uh, and it just takes people outside of themselves and gives them something to think about other than obsessing about you know, their losses or their health. Or, um, and obviously there are great benefits to having a dog because of the exercise benefit. You have to get out and walk with them. Um, I think uh, dogs are also a social facilitator. You know, if you're walking down the street by yourself, nobody would ever stop and talk to you. But if you have a dog, people stop. They want to know your dog's name. and and uh, so it facilitates uh, conversation with other people and so just a great deal of, of benefits to having mm -hmm. pets. At the nursing home, resident Grace Hampel explains why she enjoys the dog therapy. <laughs> Do for you here. Just, I can't really put it into words just brings back memories because I have a thing for the little old dogs and the cats that you know you see them they're helpless and I cannot understand how somebody could take them in their home have them a few years few months mm -hmm. and then just take them wrong along the road and dump them off right and that happened a lot so you look forward to the visit yes yes mm -hmm. That little guy, he was all over me and licking me on the face. <laughs> and I got another little, he's, that little dog came to the house too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I call him, you know, Mr. Boz, but Bozzy for short. Yeah. And when he sees me now, he said, my daughter's home. He's like that little dog, just kissing me all over my face. And Sounds like you have a way with animals. Uh, well, maybe it is. And while some are skeptical of any perceived benefits from this type of therapy, Sally has seen it work firsthand. My dad was on, in the rehab unit at Blessing Hospital a couple of years ago, and um, they actually let you bring pets up there. And 
So I had, took my little dachshund up to visit him and there was a young man who had been in an accident and had a very bad head injury and was in a wheelchair and he'd been there for weeks and weeks and wasn't really making much progress. So the nurse asked me to go in and visit him and so I took my dog in and I put her on his lap and he started he started smiling and he started trying to pet her and they were just amazed because they hadn't seen that kind of um, emotion mm -hmm. or willingness to move or to really do anything. So I think it was a really good example of um, how pets can affect people, especially if they're ill. How do you find the dogs that you use in these programs? Um, it does take a special dog. Years ago, I used my own dogs because, you know, they were a uh, known quantity to me and I knew how yeah. they would behave. Um, but generally, we take, you know, little dogs or puppies, uh, first of all, just because they're easier for people to handle uh, rather than big dogs. But um, I tried taking cats, and I guess there are more dog lovers in the world than cat lovers. <laughs> and sometimes cats just don't, um, you know, do well in that kind of situation. But sure. um, we just kind of look around and kind of pick one that's calm, and we think we'll be good. Uh, the dog we took this morning uh, mm -hmm. was surprisingly good. She was very nice. She's very young, <laughs> just like six months old, right? Right. right. So. Well, and sometimes at that age they are a little bit more rambunctious than maybe what you're looking for. But <laughs> yeah, she did a good job. Yeah. So I think the other aspect of uh, benefits to people, I, I've read a lot of research that people who have pets at home actually heal faster after surgery. Uh, they have a longer life expectancy. They have lower blood pressure. Um, so I think some of the benefits are kind of... Uh, a mystery to mm -hmm. why why they're why they and how they benefit people but but there's definitely documented scientific evidence so. mm -hmm. another program they are just beginning involves taking some of the animals out into the community to be with people who are in hospice care volunteer Ty Ortball brought Norman a three-year-old cocker to see Shirley Kane uh, the program is just now getting up and running. Shirley had called um, for the first time to ask about bringing an animal to her home from the Quincy Humane Society, and I'm a volunteer there. So I'm the one that's now trying to put the program in place as far as Blessing Hospital and the Humane Society, incorporating the animals from the facility and the hospice mm. program. So it's really just beginning. It just means, oh, a loving, warm, animal come to see you and oh it just makes you feel so good and they love you no matter what and it just they're just great when they went to do research on putting this program together they quickly learned that as far as they could tell this hadn't been done before and were on their own in figuring out how to get it going Nothing, nothing, just gone with, you know, the response from Shirley and the animals, the feedback from Sally Westerhoff, and then getting together with the hospice volunteer coordinator to see what we could do, work out. So hopefully in the future, there'll be a brochure that they can put into the admissions folder for the hospice patients. The hospice program is just one of a few of the group's new features. The biggest is the facility itself. Uh, planned and fundraised for about 10 years and finally moved in in April of last year. Uh, the facility is 10,000 square feet. Um, we have separate intake areas for cats and dogs. We have an isolation area and then we have our adoptable cat, kitten, dog areas. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a room for exotic animals like our guinea pigs and ferrets. And, uh, some nice get acquainted rooms where people can uh, take an animal, get to know it. We have a community education center, and we also have a low-cost spay-neuter clinic. Okay, so you've you've got it all covered pretty well, and the dog park for the community. <laughs> so That's yeah, great. it's uh, pretty much an all-encompassing mm -hmm. facility. You can get more information on the outreach and hospice programs by going online to quincyhumanesociety.org. When people look for help with emotional struggles like anger management, problem solving, or even patience, they typically go to a self-help book, a counselor, or even a trusted friend. But they don't usually think of life on the farm as a means of emotional support. 
Refuge Ranch is a place where hurting people find hope through a relationship with animals. Tucked away off the Pawnee blacktop, halfway between Pawnee and Lake Springfield, is a place kids can go to find some shelter from life's storms. In 2009, Stephen and Chris Daniels opened Refuge Ranch, a four-acre sanctuary of sorts, where not only children, but animals as well get some extra TLC. While Stephen's day job keeps him busy as a minister at a local church, Chris stays busy with all of the chores and work a ranch requires. Your overall mission statement here. What is Refuge about? Uh, Refuge is about connecting herding kids uh, with animals that have been taken out of oftentimes uh, abusive or neglectful situations and pairing them together in the healing process and that's really the heart of what we do. And how did you come up with this? And you obviously didn't dream it up on your own. Uh, no, the, the, short, the short side of the story is that um, when we moved home, uh, we, we were living in Chicago, in inner city Chicago, and when we moved home to Springfield, um, it had been my dream my entire life to live on a farm. And uh, so we just, we started looking for, for a place. And, and once we found it, um, my husband and I have been involved in, in working with kids for a long time. And we knew we wanted to combine that with animals somehow, and we weren't real sure what it would look like. But as I was sharing that with a friend, uh, she told me she had a book I, I ought to read. And the book told the story of a ranch in Oregon that's doing on a very large scale uh, what we're doing here at the ranch. And let's see if we can get him to go forward with lots of energy. Let's tap him a little more even. Tap him a little more. There we go. There you go. How long have you had Refuge open? This is our second open season, um, so really not a long time. Um, we're, um, we've been overwhelmed by the amount of growth that's happened in just two years. Mm -hmm. um, but last year was our first open season, and so this year we're about in the middle. Uh, we go through October 31st. So. Tell me about the kids. How do you find them? How do they find you? Oh gosh, the kids come from all over, from uh, area churches, um, word of mouth, um, probably word of mouth is, is the, the biggest. Um, when we initially launched things for the ranch, we really anticipated that we would spend our first year fundraising, um, getting the word out in the community. And what there happened instead was so that people What's were next? so excited about the idea that, that there was a place their kids could come and connect with animals, um, that it, it's just, we'd get calls and emails, you know, my, my mom's sister's brother told me about your place. And it, it's just really been cool to watch the snowball effect. So the kids come from all over the place. And the kids here are, um, you have a little bit of a different spin than a typical therapeutic writing yes. ranch in that it's more of an emotional angle, correct? Yeah, the kids here, uh, most of them, and we have worked with kids with some mild physical disabilities, but primarily the kids who come um, struggle more with emotional or uh, behavioral issues. Um, and some of the kids really come from fairly stable backgrounds. They just don't have access to horses any other way. And so we've really just tried to make it a place where every kid who needs a, a place to be loved and just have a Good time and be a kid uh, is welcome to come. When the kids come to refuge, they don't just come in and hop on a horse. It's a farm and there's lots of responsibility, lots of chores. So they spend the first 30 minutes of their session time helping out on the farm. The chores around a horse ranch typically include stall cleaning, feeding, and grooming. And while they're not necessarily fun, they help teach the kids about responsibility and focusing on a task. This is their ranch. We, we make that very clear from the time they come. And uh, we really emphasize that we want it to be a place that they can be proud of, um, that they can take ownership. And part of that is work. It takes a lot of work to keep a farm running. You know that. And so um, they're, when they come, they come for a 90 minute session. And the first 20 to 30 minutes of that is spent working on whatever project we're working on. They might stain fences or scrub troughs or uh, scoop poop. We do a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have anybody have issues with that? Oh yeah, they, they, a lot of them start out tiptoeing around and holding their noses. And, um, but you know, most of them, it doesn't take long before they roll up their sleeves. And one of the coolest things is when they come to the roundups or other things where they can bring friends, 
it's so cool to watch a kid climb out of the car and grab their friend by the hand and start running around and, and say, you know, this is Titus and this is Jackson and I built that fence over there. You know, they really do have ownership in, in, um, in what's going on and I love that. It's not just a writing program, um, that's in fact really only a small part um, of what we do in the grand scheme of things. Uh, again, the, the heart of it is that a lot of the animals who are here at the ranch have come out of um, neglectful or abusive situations and many of them aren't even broke to ride yet. Um, and so the kids come and we ask them to be partners with us in the rehabilitation process. And so um, sometimes that involves riding and, and working to get the horses to that point. We do have some horses here broke and very safe and ready to go. Sometimes that involves spending an hour teaching a horse to pick his feet up or, or back up, um, stuff that a lot of kids might find boring, but these guys understand they're investing in something bigger bigger than themselves and so um, so really the riding is just a small part of what we do. Like many small grassroots organizations, volunteers play a key part in its success and Refuge Ranch is no different, but it's not as easy as just signing up. You mentioned that you need more mentors. What is a mentor? Um, again, the heart of our program is built around the mentorship and so um, when the kids come and work with the animals that are in the rehab process they work with a mentor they work with the same mentor each time uh, we try to get them out once a week sometimes it looks more like twice a month it, it just depends on you know on how many kids we have coming out at the time but they come for a 90 minute session and they're paired with an adult and that same adult works with them at each each session and so some of what we see happening um, as kids are growing and gaining confidence um, and Throw kind of conquering some of the issues that they have um, it happens because right, of that long-term relationship between them and their mentor you, you know there's that consistency the and there's this adult who's investing in the kid just because they love them well, um, Chris and I are friends, and she had discussed her vision uh, about refuge. And uh, when I heard the concept of taking abused and neglected animals and using them with children who are suffering too, um, I was just so excited and said, well, what are we waiting for? Let's just get going. And um, it's just been a huge blessing to be a part of what's going on. No, you're doing great. And now, yeah, so this one you kind of want to pull down. In working with the kids, the mentors get to see firsthand how each child relates to their surroundings at the ranch, with each kid engaging in different ways. So we can get a loop there. I don't think we're going to That's interesting go because um, I've got two different types of girls that I'm mentoring right now. One is in love with horses and wants to know everything there is to know about horses and is fairly confident working with them. And the other one is just the opposite, a little more timid. Uh, but they both relate in different ways, and um, the one that is a little less confident with them, I, I think relates to some of the horses that have you know been kind of um, trying to find their way. purpose out here too. Uh, there's one in particular um, that's a pony that doesn't come up to other people, but seems to have attached to this girl that's not as um, confident with her horse skills. So I've seen her feel special because that horse is kind of attached to her. And as Chris said, it's not an equestrian program, which means being a mentor is about more than teaching a child how to ride a horse. So that's, that's kind of what the mentorship looks like. It's, it's just, you know, willingness to come and love on a kid. Um, it's a little challenging because it's a bit of a specialized uh, you need somebody who knows something about horses, Something right? about horses, yeah. um, who is capable of handling a 1,200-pound animal safely so, and at the same time dealing with a child who might be a little bit difficult or uh, not have the best attention span. And so um, it's a little specialized. And, and obviously, uh, it takes time for us to get to know mentors. We, we're not, we, we love the kids and are very protective of the kids who come here, so we're not willing just to throw people into that relationship right off the bat. Um, we expect them to come and invest in other ways, build a relationship with the ranch first, mm -hmm. and then if it's a good fit will involve them in the mentoring program. My favorite part is after a session when I work with a child and uh, they come away just beaming at what they've accomplished. They walk in and I've had them say, I can't do it, I'm just not strong enough or I don't know and I just am their cheerleader the whole time. You can do it, look what you are doing, look what you did for the horse today. It's the most exciting, most fulfilling thing. Um, at the end of the day. That's what I love the most about it is my interaction with the children and how they come away just um, feeling like they've done something special. In 
In addition to writing, Chris brings everyone together once a month over the summer for the Roundup, a laid-back event that not only makes for a fun afternoon, but as you might imagine, a messy one as well. Oh, okay, roundups are probably my favorite refuge activity. Um, we, we have one event a month, and we started roundups for several reasons. Um, one of the primary ones was that we had more kids than we were able to get out here involved in the mentorship program. Uh, we don't have enough mentors as, for, for the kids that we have interested. Um, but it was our heart that we never had to say to a kid, there's not room for you. And so we started you know, asking ourselves, what can we do to get anybody who wants to be here, here? interacting with the animals, just having a good time. And so the idea for Roundups was kind of born. And again, also, uh, they do these at Crystal Peaks. And so we got some, some of the framework for what we do from there. But, um, but anyway, we just, we just wanted it to be a time when anybody who wanted to come could. And, and then we started to take that a little further and say, well, let's do things that the kids never get to do anywhere else. Messy things. <laughs> and that's kind of, kind of evolved to be, uh, yeah, messy things. Any way we can just get insane. But, I mean, really, a lot of times kids, and, and particularly some of the kids who come to the ranch, they don't have the opportunity to be kids and just let go and be wild and crazy. And, you know, actually, a lot of adults come and seem to enjoy that too. <laughs> right. Myself included, you know, it's just, it's just fun to let go and be crazy. And I want um, kids who might never have the chance to experience camp be able to come here and have that experience, that time where they don't get to do that anywhere else but the ranch. So. Volunteers at Refuge Ranch do more than just work with the kids. Practically every part of the operation relies on volunteers. The barn itself needed a little TLC before the program could open its doors. So this is the finished product of all your hard work. Yeah, I don't know if anything is ever a finished product here. We always have projects, but yeah, we, I mean, volunteers have helped with every aspect of this place from building fences to staining stalls. Um, and this is, I mean, we look around and are just overwhelmed by how much it's just, how far it's come in two years. Oh, yeah. well, how many stalls do you have then? We have, uh, we have four stalls and actually two of them are used for storage most of the time. We really only use the stalls when one of the horses is sick or injured mm -hmm. or uh, when we need to quarantine new rescues that have come in. Um, for the most part, they live outside with the herd and, mm -hmm. and we just really think they're healthier and happier that way. Right. Um, so the stalls are used minimally, but they're wonderful to have when we need them. How many horses do you have here? Uh, we actually have seven horses right now. Mm -hmm. um, we have five that are permanent residents uh, that will stay here probably as long as they live or as long as they're a good fit for our program. Um, and then we have two that were rescued not too long ago uh, who've been here a couple of months. And uh, once they're ready, they'll be adopted into new homes. Do you find that you fit the personality of the horse with the personality of the kid? You know, we really let the kids choose who they want to work with. And, and sometimes we'll, we'll steer if we think that, you know, it's not a good fit. Um, but we found really that the horses are quite intuitive about what kids need, which is a really cool thing to see. Um, and and we, really, we really let the kids choose, uh, for the most part, who they want to work mm -hmm. with. What kind of progress have you seen over the last two years? Uh, with the kids? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, again, it's, it's such a work in progress and we're still young um, and so it's, you know, it, uh, sometimes I think we don't have the big, uh, the big stories that people are looking for. What has been really cool um, and I think the most marked difference I've seen in kids is just confidence. Mm -hmm. um, the kids come and a lot of times they have struggled with school, they've struggled socially, they've just struggled in every area of their life. They've not had the chance to succeed very often and it's really cool to watch a kid come here. Um, and, and, and be scared to death and they're very nervous and horses are big and, yes. and a, a little challenging to manage sometimes. Some of the horses here are not trained. To watch them come and develop this skill set that allows them to manage a 1,200 pound animal and to see them realize that, the confidence just happens and it's really cool to watch that change in kids. You can get more information about the ranch and the program by going online to refuge-ranch.org. For anyone who has ever owned a pet, it comes as no surprise that these furry, feathered, or even finned creatures can be a source of comfort and companionship, as well as teach us a thing or two about ourselves. That's all we have time for on this edition of In Life. We'd like to thank Sally at the Quincy Humane Society and Chris at Refuge Ranch for their assistance and help in putting this program together. For all of us, I'm Becky Gramblett. Thanks for watching.
If you have questions or comments, email us at inlife at wsec.tv. This program is brought to you in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and through the financial support of viewers like you. Thank you. Funding for arts segments on In Life is provided by the Illinois Arts Council, a state agency. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.